From boats that float to boats that hover, it changed how we travel. From room-sized radios to those that fit in a pocket, it revolutionized electronics. And from anonymous asteroids traveling through space to a man-made satellite orbiting Earth, it opened the door to the universe. They were all inventions of the 1950s, a decade defined by fast food, fast cars, and even faster music. The hovercraft, the transistor radio, and the breathalyzer were all inventions that shook the world. The 1950s saw a race to produce the first transistor radio. Although just beaten by the Regency TR1, a pair of inventors would build the super company Sony because of their invention. In the late 1940s, two Tokyo engineers were struggling to keep their small electronics company afloat. Because post-war Japan was in ruins, their tape recorders and other gadgets were not selling. There was no steady power supply. There were no tools. There was no consumer class left. There was no money to buy something, even if you had something to sell. Masaru Ibuka started the company in 1946. Ibuka was a sort of bumbling, big, slightly stooped over, not very fashionable, brilliant inventor, and even more gorgeously brilliant inspirer of inventions. Ibuka employed the best and brightest minds, including Akio Morita, who turned his back on his family's sake dynasty to study physics. Morita had the ability to pioneer a market when no market existed. He said, you don't know you want this, but by the time I'm through with you, you won't be able to do without it. The market they wanted to break into was the US, where new electronic gadgets were everywhere. They eagerly give their attention to what's new and beautiful and advanced. From beauty products to labor-saving devices. But what to invent for a nation that seemed to have everything? Ibuka wondered if a recent scientific breakthrough, the transistor, could be the key. It was a tiny new device that amplified electronic signals. It controlled the flow of a current and switched that flow off and on. The revolutionary part of transistors was that they were a fraction of the size of anything that had previously existed. Ibica was intrigued. He knows nothing about them but he knows that they're a power source that's tiny. That's all he needs to know, he wants it. The power source at the time was the glass vacuum tube. These cumbersome tubes meant the TVs and radios of the 1950s were so big they took up half a room. This gave the inventors an idea. A smaller radio that listeners could carry around with them, made using the new transistors. This transistor would be their entrance, their entry key into the American market, which they wanted desperately. They bought a license from Western Electric, the US company that developed the first transistor. But the early version was so weak, it could only power tiny devices, such as hearing aids. Inspired, as always, by Ibuka's insistence, by his fixation, by his focus, and by his energy, the company's engineers outdid themselves for nearly a year, struggling with what to do with this feeble little transistor. They discovered that the transistor's power was boosted with a process called phosphorus doping. Injecting microscopic amounts of the mineral added free-floating electrons to the metal in the transistor. This dramatically improved its ability to conduct electricity and increased power flow. 
The next challenge was to make miniature radio parts. There were many dead ends that were encountered, obviously. How do we make this thing work? Because this was, of course, their baby. They had put a lot on the line. They had borrowed money. Though the Regency TR1 was unveiled in 1954, they weren't discouraged and had a prototype finished by 1955. And it worked like a dream. There was tremendous exhilaration and exuberance that went through Ibuka and Morita. It was a, a thrilling moment when that transistor was originally placed into the wiring which had been designed to run this little radio and it worked. Next, they had to find a company name that Americans could pronounce. Moritor, the marketing expert, suggested a clever combination. The Latin word for sound, sonus, combined with sunny, slang for boy. And so, Sony was born. This is a marvelous story because it meant to him a sunny boy, a young guy, was brimming with energy and exuberance and vitality. So let's take sound, mix it with Sonny Boy, and come up with Sony. And that's where the name came from. In April 1955, Morita went to America to sell the Sony radio. But the response was not enthusiastic. The transistor radio business in the United States encountered some very considerable resistance. 1950s was a time when Americans were going bigger and better, not smaller and better. So these huge consoles, bigger cars, bigger everything. Then Morita met the executives with a Bulliver watch company, who were impressed. Jim, this could be what we're looking for. I think so. And they said, we get it. We think people want a radio they can carry around with them easily, and we will buy from you 100,000 units. That translated, in terms of money, into more than the entire company's capitalized worth. How many can we get? It seemed as if a dream had come true, but there was a drawback. Boulevard wanted its own name on the product, not Sony's. They said, we'll buy 100,000 of these things, but you have to put our name on them. And Morita said, no. Morita's decision shocked the executives. I mean, that's the most important moment in the entire transistor radio story. And Morita later said about it that his, it was his most important business decision he ever made. Back in Japan, Morita and Ibuka changed their strategy. They began work on selling the concept of a radio that would fit in your pocket. But it won't fit. The solution was to invent a bigger pocket. The early transistor radios didn't quite fit into a normal shirt pocket. But Morita had equipped his sales force with extra large pockets to make the illusion work. The pocket-sized radio became a huge hit in Japan. And then the US finally wanted the radio too. In November 1957, Sony chartered an entire cargo plane to export enough radios to the US in time for Christmas. A new era of portable sound was underway. And the man who started Sony went on to build one of the most powerful brands in history. More inventions of the decade. 1951, liquid paper. A clever correction fluid invented by a Dallas secretary who made the first batch in her kitchen blender. 1952, the bongo board took balancing acts out of the circus and onto the street. By using bongo, bingo, everything shapes up nicely. And 1959, the three-point safety belt snapped into place. Plunk, click, every trick. And helped to save more lives during crashes.
Today's satellites predict weather. They help navigation and enable mobile phones to work. The very first satellite, called Sputnik, didn't actually do anything. But both it and its inventor attracted the world's attention. In the mid-1950s, Sergei Korolev was the Soviet Union's leading rocket scientist, head of missile development. He was a person who projected force and strength. And he would move to meetings and he would dominate a meeting just by the power of his personality and, and the power of his ideas. Korolev's passion for rockets began early. In the 1930s, he led a government team experimenting with primitive rockets. But like many of his compatriots, he fell victim to Soviet politics. He was tortured and sentenced to 10 years in a Siberian labor camp. It was basically a death camp. People were not expected to come back from there. They'd be worked and they'd die there. But Korolev was a survivor. During the Cold War, Soviet leaders knew he had the knowledge they required to compete with the US. The Cold War was almost a contest not for the present, but for the future. Which of the two different systems, the US system or the Soviet system, would be the model that the rest of the world would come to follow in the decades and generations ahead? Korolev developed a new generation of rockets, which could carry nuclear warheads, based on technology from World War II Germany. But Korolev's dream wasn't to build weapons. He wanted to explore space. He thought if a rocket could launch a warhead from one continent to another, the same type of rocket should be able to launch a satellite into orbit around the Earth. He knew the math. He knew that a missile that could go 15,000 miles an hour to throw, to throw a warhead to North America could, with a little bit of change, go 18,000 miles an hour to throw a radio into space to circle the Earth, a radio that would be a, a satellite. He realized that a secondary rocket could be added to the main rocket, and that this secondary rocket could carry the satellite inside its nose cone. The primary rocket would propel the secondary rocket to the edge of space, reach maximum speed, and release it. The secondary rocket would travel faster on its own, carrying the satellite into orbit. When the missile is going as fast as it can, that small rocket fires and goes a little bit faster on its own. The big missile never does go into orbit. It drops back to Earth. The little rocket has enough extra speed to make this loop around the Earth, this falling forever around the Earth, under the force of gravity. But Korolev was not the only one with ambitions for space. The US was determined to get there first and announced a plan to launch the world's first satellite. The Soviets very quickly announced that they were going to do one too, which to most of the world was just a Me Tooism kind of a, bra a boast. It was unfortunately typical of what the Soviets had done in the past for propaganda. Korolev seized his opportunity. Pravda. Da. Da. Pravda. Korolev says, well, if that's the case, we have a bunch of rockets here ready to fire anyway. Can we use them for the satellite? And Khrushchev said, go ahead. So with Khrushchev's approval, Korolev ordered testing on his R-7 rocket. The aim was to make sure it was capable of launching a satellite into space. But there were problems with everything from boosters to emergency shutdown systems. The R-7 required redesigning. The stakes for Korolev were immense. If he couldn't get this rocket to work, other people would have tried. He had competitors who were trying to get his job. If he lost the favor of Khrushchev, he'd lose the cash flow, he'd lose the influence, he'd lose his job, he might even lose his freedom. 
On the 3rd of August, 1957, the R-7 returned to the launch pad, then lifted off perfectly. The next challenge was to build the satellite. In a sterile room, a metal sphere the size of a beach ball began to take shape. It was called Sputnik, Russian for satellite. Koronyev was under constant surveillance, as under the regime, everyone was a potential enemy. One miscalculation, one wrong word, and the authorities would remove them from the mission. September 1957, and Korolev was racing to finish Sputnik. His orders were simple. Once in space, the satellite's mission was to ensure the whole world knew it was out there. And Korolev's design was brilliantly simple. It was basically a couple transmitters, their batteries, a uh, pressure and temperature sensor, all housed in a metal sphere. The simplest possible design for a satellite. The completed Sputnik was an 83-kilogram ball. Its contents were hermetically sealed inside a durable shell made of aluminium, magnesium and titanium. Less than two months after construction began, Sputnik was ready for launch inside the nose cone of a mighty R-7 rocket. No one was sure if the rocket would, be, would fly high enough, or accurately enough, or fast enough. It was, it was a gamble. Sergei Korolev took his seat at mission control. The countdown began. Two hundred and twenty-three kilometers above Earth, Sputnik emerged from the nose cone of the rocket and went into orbit. It was a major achievement, but it would mean nothing unless the whole world heard its radio signal, the moment Korolev's team had planned for. They picked a radio frequency, actually, that was the common radio amateur frequency around the world. So they didn't, as the Americans did, take the radio frequencies and put them into unused parts of the radio spectrum where no one would interfere and no one could hear. They picked one to go right in the middle of the amateur radio band so everybody could hear. Korolev waited anxiously for the radio signal. Then five minutes and 14 seconds after launch. <laughs> Clearly, they're overjoyed. They were just weeping with, with joy at, this, at the success of the project. Korolev himself sat there and gave a short speech about the best hopes of mankind having been achieved by the team here tonight. It was a beep that changed the world. The US was amazed and stunned that the Soviet Union had beaten them into space. I said, we should have been the first ones to have it, if there's such a thing. It's my opinion. When Sputnik was launched, it was such a shocking event, such a surprising event, that although it wasn't an attack, physical attack on the United States, it was a spiritual attack on the United States. People were staggered to their souls by, by this concept that the Soviets could do things that we couldn't yet do, and those things could have very severe national security implications. Sputnik beeped for 23 days until the transmitter batteries died. It continued to orbit Earth for a further nine weeks. As it re-entered Earth's atmosphere, the world's first man-made satellite disintegrated. But Sputnik changed the world forever. It was a symbol of entry to space. It was a symbol of a new dimension in human existence. Sputnik was basically kicking in the door of heaven. Within five months of Sputnik's launch, the U.S. launched a satellite, Explorer 1. 
Sergei Korolev went on to even greater achievements, building rockets that sent the first humans into space. Other inventions of the decade. 1950, the credit card. Plastic replaced paper as the way to pay. 1954, Teflon cookware, the non-stick wonder, easy cleaning in the kitchen. Billy, it's something with Teflon on it. And 1956, videotape, less expensive than film and far more convenient. Our evenings would never be the same again. This tape can be erased and used again. Once, roadside alcohol tests proved useless in catching impaired drivers. The police couldn't prove it, so the drunks got off. Then a forensics expert invented a machine that cannot be fooled. In the 1950s, Robert Birkenstein was the head of an Indiana crime laboratory. One scene he'd had to photograph far too often were the deaths on motorways caused by impaired drivers. Whilst drink driving was illegal in the US in the 1950s, it was almost impossible to obtain a guilty verdict. You've got to be kidding. Give me that. Let's go. There was a real serious problem with alcohol and driving. People getting behind the wheel of a car after they'd had a few drinks. And there was no effective way to measure the level of intoxication. Bolkenstein wanted to change that. He didn't have a college degree. He was just brilliant. And he could look at something and determine how it was supposed to work and how to put it together and to train others with it. After seeing one too many senseless accidents, Borkenstein was determined to devise a roadside test for inebriation. He began to think about what scientists already knew about alcohol in the human body and realized the answer could lie in a discovery made decades earlier. When alcohol enters the human bloodstream, the alcohol molecules move into the lungs, into millions of tiny air sacs called alveoli. When exhaled, alcohol is released from the alveoli into the breath, along with carbon dioxide. In the 1930s, that had led to the invention of the drunkometer. The drunkometer was the first actual breath-testing instrument that was ever devised. It involved a person blowing into a balloon, and then the sample of breath was run through a series of chemicals. And based on the chemical reaction, it was possible to determine an approximate value of what their blood alcohol concentration was. But Borkenstein knew the drunkometer wasn't accurate. Though it detected the presence of alcohol, it did not measure the percentage of alcohol in the bloodstream. Plus, the machine wasn't portable, and it required a scientist to operate it. Seeing these limitations, he immediately, in the back of his mind, started, you know, churning up ideas on how to improve it, how to make it more accurate, how to make it simpler. Borkenstein began to improve the drunkometer. First, he removed the leaky balloon and replaced it with an airtight chamber to collect the breath sample. Next, he had to devise a method of measuring the exact percentage of alcohol in the blood. However, for the result to be accepted in court, he needed to find a way to measure the counterchange. He realized the answer lay in an area he knew well, photography. He used to build cameras. He was one of the first people to use color film in forensic science. He worked with the military in helping develop a color comparator 
to assist in bombing raids. Borkenstein had also worked with a densitometer, a photographic instrument that measured the darkness or density of photographic film and gave it a numerical value. He wondered whether a similar instrument could measure color change in a breath sample. Borkenstein installed a photometer lamp that compared the color density of liquid in two small vials. The breath sample was released into one of the vials. Alcohol reacted with the chemical and changed color. The photometer measured exactly how much lighter the alcohol sample was than the reference sample, thus revealing the exact percentage of alcohol in the blood. He had built the machine. Now he had to prove that it was accurate and reliable. When Dr. Borgenstein realized that he had this instrument almost perfected, he had to test it. So, like any good scientist, he fixed himself a scotch and soda, and he drank it. And he gave himself a series of breath tests and recorded the results. It worked exactly as he'd hoped. He called his invention the breathalyzer. Finally, there was a method to convict drunk drivers, using a test that's almost impossible to refute in court. Well, there are a lot of theories out there about how you can, quote, beat the breathalyzer. And I can tell you right now, everyone who tries it is wasting their time. So Borkenstein's invention is used to convict millions of drunk drivers and helped turn a deadly habit into a taboo. Engine failure, human error, or a bomb. Investigating why planes crash can be impossible if there are no survivors. But at least one witness always survives to tell the tale. And it was all because an Australian refused to give up on a good idea. In 1953, aviation investigators in Melbourne were facing a difficult task. Finding out why a passenger jet destined for Australia crashed as it was leaving Pakistan, killing everyone on board. One investigator was combustion expert David Warren, whose job was to discover how and why things exploded. He was the son of Australian missionaries and had lost his father in a plane crash. The final gift that David's father gave to him as a young boy was a crystal radio set, which is really a simple radio receiver. David loved the little gadget, and it sparked his natural curiosity in things electronic or mechanical. He went on to build his own little radio sets and sold them to schoolmates at the time. He ended up working at Melbourne's Aeronautical Research Lab. But experts were mystified by the latest crash. There was no wreckage, survivors, or witnesses to provide clues. He started to think about this little gadget he'd just seen at a trade fair in Melbourne. It was the Minifon pocket recorder, the world's first miniature pocket recorder. He wondered if a similar device could be installed in cockpits, which would record what was happening when pilots were dealing with an emergency. It was a new and revolutionary idea. It was as if David's scientific mind and his imaginative side came together and this idea came out of it. The challenge was to convince his superiors. His boss at the time wasn't interested. In fact, he said to David, this really isn't your line of work. Go back to blowing up fuel tanks. David didn't give up. He was certain the solution to solving plane crashes was to record every sound in the cockpit so investigators could replay the final minutes before a crash. Instead of using tape, he used wire as the recording mechanism, as it stood a better chance of surviving an impact and fire. Through trial and error, he built a prototype. To make it crash and fire resistant, he houses his invention in a titanium box. 
He took it to Australia's aviation authorities. But there was more disappointment. Not all of David's colleagues, and certainly not aviation authorities, were enthusiastic or supportive of David's idea. Privacy was a big issue. In fact, there's some interesting quotes that from the Pilots' Federation. It would be like a spy on board. Um, the Air Force said the tapes could yield more expletives than explanations. David was up against hostility and indifference. It seemed as if David's invention was doomed. But a VIP visiting from England wanted to have a look at the prototype. Pleasure to meet you. Come and show me what you've been working on. Robert Hardingham was a former air marshal who had helped to guide the Royal Air Force to victory in the Battle of Britain. David's boss at the time invited him to come to the lab and see David's little demonstration unit and explain what his idea. And Sir Robert Hardingham was immediately enthusiastic about it. He thought it was a great idea. He believed it was going to be a great tool for air accident investigation. David was invited to go to England with Hardingham to demonstrate his invention. He was given a team of engineers to further develop the unit. With the support from Britain, the aeronautical research labs decided to finally put some funding into this project. A journalist called the flight recorder the black box. Like a little black book, it is full of important information. It was not until 1977 that the black box made headlines. In Tenerife, two Boeing 747s collided on a runway. 583 people were killed and hundreds more were injured. A lot of debris flew, large pieces of metal thrown up in the air and around. It was one of the deadliest aviation disasters in history. And thanks to the black box, its cause was quickly established. On reviewing the cockpit voice recordings, it was revealed that there had been confusion between the pilots and confusion with the air traffic control that led to this horrendous crash. It was critical information that would probably never have been discovered without the black box proving their fundamental worth to aviation. The black box recorder changed the world because it gave air accident investigators another dimension into investigation of an air crash. If human flight is a supreme achievement of the 20th century, then surely the cockpit voice recorder is one of the most important safety inventions for the aviation industry. David Warren never made any money from his invention. But in 2002, 49 years after his brainwave, he was finally awarded the Order of Australia. More inventions of the decade. 1958, the hula hoop, a new toy that sent the whole world spinning. In 1953, the TV dinner. Easy meat and potatoes for those with a busy life. Also in 1953, the car that parked itself using a fifth wheel, meaning it could be turned on a sixpence. A concept that quickly stalled. frozen Arctic to the combat zone. The hovercraft revolutionized travel over land and water. All because of an Englishman who thought of a way to float and fly. In 1951, Christopher Cockerell had retired and was enjoying an idyllic life on the English coast, designing and building pleasure boats. He was a remarkable man, a real British gentleman. 
he, he didn't suffer fools, uh, but he was remarkably intelligent and he could have a conversation with anybody on anything. Cockerell had had a brilliant career at the Marconi Wireless Company. He pioneered aircraft communication and retired with 36 patents to his name. During the war, he had also worked on wireless messaging for troops on the move. Navigation was always a massive problem, and in that time he saw the massive losses that Britain and the Allies were having in Normandy. But there was one memory that continually haunted Cockerell. The D-Day landings of 1944, when thousands of Allied troops were either killed by enemy fire or drowned because their ships couldn't reach shore. The landings were the most dangerous part. Uh, many British soldiers and Allied forces got killed. And uh, if they'd had an amphibious vehicle that could get them up the beach dry, uh, it would have made a big difference to the World War losses. Cockerell was determined to build an amphibious vehicle. He knew that meant defying the laws of friction to create a whole new kind of machine. He knew that the water resistance, the friction was very hard to overcome. Really, the best way to do is lift out the water altogether and not have any of the friction or the drag. In other words, how do you make a boat fly? Cockerell believed the answer was to create a cushion of air between the hull and the water. And he thought he knew how to do it. To test his idea, he gathered a few simple household items. A hairdryer, a couple of empty tins and a set of scales. He suspended the hairdryer above the two cans. The smaller container placed inside the larger one. The air from the dryer was forced downward between the two tins. This compressed the air into a high pressure jet. The more pressure, the greater the chance of keeping an object aloft. Cockerell then built the tin can concept into a simple prototype, powering it with an engine from a model airplane. During testing, it did what it was designed to do, hovering just above the water at a speed of 13 knots. He'd done the mathematics and he knew it was going to work, so he wasn't surprised when it worked. He called it the hovercraft. But Cockrell couldn't convince anyone that it was an idea worth pursuing. Cockrell was unsuccessful initially in getting this idea off the ground, so to speak. He went round everybody, all the right people, he had contacts in the air ministry, and they said, lovely idea, but it's not really an aircraft, it's a boat. He had contacts in the, the boating industry, and uh, they said, well, it is an aircraft, it's not really a boat. However, Cockrell persisted, demonstrating his model whenever he could. He waited for almost two years, but nothing happened. Then, the world discovered that the Swiss had the same idea. It was only the fact that uh, other people in the world had got ideas of, about Cockrell's invention. Uh, there was danger that other people in the world would start doing it, that Britain suddenly put some money into it. But it was not the military that developed the hovercraft, because the war was over. Instead, construction began in 1958 on a civilian passenger craft, the SRN-1. The base of the craft was a buoyant tank, nine meters long, made from lightweight aluminium. A deck took shape on top of the tank. A giant fan was installed, and its air would be guided downward toward jets that would create the required cushion of air. After months of construction and testing, the hovercraft was ready for its maiden voyage in front of an international audience. So Christopher said from the beginning, Britain needs a shop window for the hovercraft, and what's better than using the English Channel? July 25th, 1959. The hovercraft left France and headed out into the English Channel. Cockerell was one of the three-man crew. 
During the crossing, he was almost knocked overboard by waves from a passing ship. Two hours and three minutes after departure, he made a grand entrance into Dover Harbour. He made light of it very much so that you know, it was a piece of cake, he said to the um, people down in the beach, the reporters waiting for him. One of his diaries, he wrote it was a nightmare. You know, it was amazing we ever got through it. The hovercraft's popularity caught on. It prompted all types of variations, including powerful military vehicles, just as Cockerell had first imagined. The lovely thing about the hovercraft, it's being used everywhere today. You can find them in the Aleutians, taking people to school. You can find them in Korea, in defense. You can find them in Africa, doing hovering doctor services. You can find them in Canada, breaking ice. You can find them in Scandinavia, uh, doing things that no other military vessel can do. Hovercraft are being used everywhere quietly. The hovercraft earned Cockerell a knighthood and made him one of the great transportation inventors along with men such as Henry Ford and the Wright brothers. Other ideas of the 1950s. 1957, the laser, an intensely powerful beam of light that revolutionized everything from the supermarket to the operating room. 1954, the high efficiency solar cell, capable of converting sunlight into energy six times more effectively than anything before it. And 1950, the plastic aerosol valve, turning liquid into spray, pumped out a $100 million bonanza for its inventor. <laughs>